in the world, there are bad things that happen. Along with good things that happen, there are bad things that happen. It's just a world where we have sadness and hurt. Uh, life deals us very hard things. It's this world we live in. And uh, in fact, last night I heard on the news that Japan had three earthquakes all in the same day. A number of people died. Uh, even last night there was an earthquake in, key, in uh, Ecuador, and I think 70-some people died. Buildings are collapsing and falling all over. And you ask yourself, why do these things happen? Um, people lose jobs. People die unexpectedly. Uh, people get hurt, car accidents, all this stuff. And it would be easy to just throw out the free will answer. Well, we live in this world with free will. God gave us choices. Sometimes we make poor choices and other people make poor choices and people get hurt and bad things just happen. It's kind of easy to answer the questions that are sort of, for lack of a better way to say it, easier to answer. What about the questions that are hard to answer? Like, I heard this week that there was a three-month-old child who just stopped breathing and he died. And I know the uncle of this family and he said, yeah, the, the mother and father are just devastated. Their child just passed away for no reason. That SIDS thing. People just stopped breathing, you know. Uh, this week I went and saw a member of our church, Paula Morgan. Her husband uh, took a nap at lunch and stopped breathing and passed away. She tried CPR for half an hour. The paramedics came and tried uh, CPR for 45 more minutes. They gave him all this medication, all this stuff, and he never woke up and passed away. And I think, why do things like this happen? And, and maybe one small answer, one way to answer this, and this is maybe one filling in your program, is we live in a broken world. We live in a world that just happens to be broken. I mean, it started uh, off this beautiful creation in Genesis, and God said everything is perfect and everything is right, and He said a number of times everything is good. In fact, when He got to the end of creation, He's or the creating part of it, He said everything is very good because God had created it and He had created mankind in His image, and He had this amazing plan for all of us. And then we. Messed it all up. Adam and Eve made these choices that brought sin into the world and the consequences fall out from there. I mean, if you turn from Genesis 3 to Genesis chapter 4, the first murder happens. The two sons of Adam and Eve, one kills the other one. And then Genesis chapter 6, Noah and the flood happens. And God says, all right, this whole world is, is not working out the way I thought it would and let's just do a restart. And I mean, from there on, you just see sin captivating the world and taking things apart and bad things just continue to happen. We live in a very broken world. In fact, you get all the way to the New Testament and Jesus says in John chapter 16, in this world, you will have trouble. It's almost a promise. Uh, and then he says, but take heart, I've overcome the world. It's not as though you're alone in the world. I've overcome it. And he was giving hope with the Holy Spirit to say, I will meet with you and walk with you in this suffering. But it's very recognizable that we live in a very broken and hurt world. So things happen. Evil happens. Bad things happen. And I think sometimes bad things are relative. My bad thing may not be your bad thing. I mean, me losing a number of jobs along the way of getting to this place may not be what you would consider bad, but for you to lose a spouse or to lose a child or to lose a, a nephew or niece to death for some unforsaken reason is, that's a bad thing. You know, so we kind of think relatively sometimes. Maybe number two is true. Maybe we just bring it on ourselves. I found this picture online. There's this whole category of why women live longer than men. If you Google that online, you'll see a myriad of pictures of all these men doing really foolish things, like this guy climbing a ladder on the side of the fireplace on top of a roof and trying to fix his gutter or whatever. And you go, men just sort of risk it a little bit more. Sometimes we do things that bring on this idea of bad. Why did I fall and break my arm? Why did I try this stuff? How come I, you know, wrecked my motorcycle? Because you're riding one. Or how come I, you know, and there's bad things that happen. Sometimes we bring it on ourselves. There's a great scripture in Galatians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul says, uh, Don't be deceived. 
God can't be mocked. We, we can't mock God. A man reaps what he sows. Women reap what they sow too, by the way, just so you know. Uh, the one who sows to please their sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And so sometimes bad things happen because we bring it on ourselves. But I don't even think we're talking about that category this morning necessarily. Because you can look at all of Scripture and you can get to this famous man in Scripture, the person of Job. Do you know him? If you've ever read through the Old Testament or seen this book, it's this guy's life, and he didn't do anything wrong. In fact, he was very righteous. And God had said, look at how righteous Job is. And Satan was in the council. He was in the midst, and he goes, hey, let me test him for a while. Let me try him and see how faithful he really is. So God and Satan have this argument, and they talk about it, and God says, well, just don't kill him. So Satan goes after him, he kills all of his kids, he brings all these boils in his life, he does all this terrible stuff, and you read this entire book, and Job suffers the worst of any person we have in, in a record in Scripture, and just goes through this incredible thing, and he was still faithful to God, and he even said at the very end, even though you slay me, I'm still going to be faithful to you, God, I'm still going to trust in the work that you do. In my life. And so you kind of have to ask the question is this really about God's character? When we say why do bad things happen, maybe we're questioning the very character of God. And that gets into pretty dangerous waters when you're questioning the God, the creator of the universe. I think the question we're really asking is is God fair? Is God a just God? And is he fair? To everybody, Is he fair to the person who just had a baby and the baby dies? Is he fair to the old person who's 97 and they're going to eventually die anyway? I mean, how is God fair? And who's good and who's not good? And these questions kind of come up in my mind. We talk about the fairness of God as if God lived in a small box. And we said, okay, God, I'm going to figure you out. I'm going to put all of my thoughts of God in this box. And God's got to work the way I want him to work. Sometimes in life, we tend to think that, okay, God, if I come to you in faith now, I get to kind of boss you around and expect these things from you. And God, if you don't answer my questions, if you don't sort of... Uh, judge the universe and rule the universe and act like God the way I think you should, then you're not a good God. And then all of a sudden I get to judge the character of God. And that's pretty dangerous waters. Because the last time I read the scriptures, the last thing I remember about God is that his character is blameless. His character is perfect. And he is holy and righteous. And over the whole universe, he gets to do what he wants to do. It's his will and not our will. But so often we put God in this small box and we say, uh, God, things are just not under my control. And, and it's your fault. We like to blame God, I think, sometimes. If it doesn't work out my way, I'm going to blame God for this happening. And then I'm going to walk away from faith as if I'm going to show God that he's wrong. And then I'm going to turn my faith away. I have a few thoughts about that. I, I don't think we have any right to, to judge God. We have been told that we submit to God. We are the sheep under His care. He is the one who leads us. So maybe there's a few other ways to look about pain or why bad things happen in the world. According to God's character, maybe this is more the thought. Maybe God wants to do something big in our life, and He takes the circumstances of life, and He changes the railroad track, and He turns it to say, you know what, I'll, I'll take what happened and I'll turn it for good. I want to do something big in your life and I'll take the thing that happened and actually use it as a, a method or a way to lead my Holy Spirit more into your life. Some people have asked me the question, well, does God make bad things happen? Or does God allow bad things to happen? And it could be both. According to Scripture, God can do what He wants to do. Do you remember with Pharaoh and Moses, God actually hardened the heart of Pharaoh so he wouldn't let the people go. God was very much a part of hardening Pharaoh's heart. I mean, Pharaoh could have chosen his own way. He could have chosen to let them all go at the very first plague that happened. But it took ten awful plagues to come across Egypt. And Pharaoh kept hardening his heart because God was hardening the heart. And God had a plan to work out in this. There's so many 
characters in Scripture, you say, well, did God make this happen? Or did God allow this to happen? The answer is yes to both. God is God. He can do what He wants to do. I love this Scripture in John chapter 9. Uh, the setting is that this blind man was healed. Jesus comes and He heals this blind man on the Sabbath. By the way, it's a it's a day where everybody's supposed to rest and not participate in you know work, and a miracle happens to be work. And even though the guy gets his eyes back, the Pharisees are upset. And so the man is walking around and he can see now. And the Pharisees come and they say, uh, "Was was uh, was he born blind? Uh, was who sinned that he was born blind? Like whose fault is it? We always want to point at the person and find out whose fault. Why did this happen?" And Jesus says, well, it wasn't this man or his parents who sinned. Jesus said, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. Sometimes God will take something that happens bad and turn it into a blessing so that God's favor and God's goodness and the spirit of God happens to come out of that situation. I love in chapter, the same chapter, verse 25, the man says, I don't know. They're asking him, well, who healed you and who did all this? He goes, I don't know. All I know is I was blind. And now I can see. I, I just get the good part. I just get to be, you know, living in this part where I can see. Let me pause just for a minute and ask you the question. Have you ever seen a bad thing happen in your life when God worked through it? A lot of you are nodding your heads. A lot of you have experienced something that has been bad in your life, hurtful in your life, painful in your life, difficult for you, and... Uh, you have seen God actually at work and working. Some of you maybe haven't. Some of you still maybe are pessimists and you look at the glass half empty. But if we stop and think for a minute, God, I believe, takes whatever bad situation and he can turn it into good if we let him. I know a lot of our stories in the room. I know a lot of what you've come through and they're terrible things. Some of them are really, really bad things. But if you've allowed God to work in you and God says, I'll change this, I'll work through this, you see the hand of God. And here's why. I believe this next point is very true. Maybe God wants you to grow in your faith. It just might be that God doesn't want you to just sit and be happy and to be neutral in faith. He actually wants you to grow. So he'll take whatever difficult thing you're facing and he'll cause that to grow in your life. This verse in James is one of the hardest verses in all of Scripture. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the what? Testing of your faith develops perseverance. Do you know that our lives are meant to be tested? That's not what you want to hear after high school graduation. You're like, I'm finally done. I don't have to have any more tests. And then you go to college. Oh, and then it gets hard. And then you go to grad school. And then, you get in, then you're an adult. And then you get married. And then you have kids. And the tests just constantly, constantly happen. I remember in grad school, I was taking this language class, Greek of all things. And I remember my professor, I was struggling with this idea of uh, in the class trying to figure out how all the verbs and adjectives work and the nouns and where do you place this and how, what does this mean? And the words are hard enough to read anyway, let alone be tested on them. And I'm getting a C in the class. I'm struggling. I can't really. So I go and I meet with a professor and I'm like, oh, I just hate tests. And it's just so dumb that I have to be tested on this language. Can't I just talk to you about this? And he goes, if you can figure out another way for me to understand how much you've learned in class, let me know. And I'm like, well, can't we just go out and have coffee? Can't we just, he goes, I'm still going to ask you questions and test you on this information. He says, the thing about testing is that it measures what you know. It measures how much you've grown. If you don't take a test, nobody will know how mature you are. Nobody will know what you're growing into. And I go, I know, but I hate that. He goes, I'm sorry. It's just the system of the world. In fact, it's in scripture. God will test our faith. God will give us a challenge that we often don't want to grow in or grow through. I was talking to Daniel, um, our youth pastor, about this idea of gifts. He says, I believe that God has in his image, in his mind, said, I, God has hundreds of gift boxes on a shelf. 
and they're all sitting there and they're waiting for us to take the gift box and to open them up and to receive this gift in our life. He says, the problem is, once you receive a gift and open it up in your life, you grow and you need to take on the responsibility of owning the gift and then using the gift for God's good. He says, the problem in our life is we don't want the responsibility to grow. And so we leave all of God's gifts on the shelf and we say, I don't want to be part of this because I don't want the responsibility to have to grow up in my faith. And God's saying, well, what are we at a stalemate? We're just going to sit here. All these gifts are for you to grow and you're not growing. So God then takes circumstances in our life and lets hard things happen, lets bad things happen to open up our eyes to growing in him. Here's another point. How about we flip the whole idea and ask the question, well, why do good things happen to bad people? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why the neighbor gets, uh, you know, they, they win this uh, incredible gift, they get a free vacation, they, the person, whoever, you know, some people that constantly get good things that happen in their life, and you're thinking, well, that's not fair either, right? Right? But we don't talk about the good things very often. We just take in the good things and just live it and receive it. Like, well, this is fine for me. I got a good thing. I didn't have to pay taxes or I got a little gift return or I won the lottery or this happened in my life and it's all good. And we sort of like shake it off and keep going. What happens when good things happen to bad people? And let's pause for a minute and ask, well, who's good and who's bad anyway? Are the good people, the people that are trying in life, the people that give a little bit in their offering, the people that stop swearing, the people that live a good life by behavior standards, and the bad people, they're the, the ones that are addicted to those things. They're stuck on the side of the road. They're, you know, bad things can happen to them. That's just fine. They deserve it. Do we have that mindset? Because if you look at the scriptures all the way back in Psalm 103, it says God doesn't treat us the way our sins deserve. You know what our sins deserve? Punishment and separation from God. God says, I'm not going to treat you that way or repay you according to your iniquity or your sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How good is God that he would give that to us without us even being around yet. We weren't even there or thought of yet and God says, I'm going to give you this gift. So good things can happen to bad people and that's actually the higher thing to ponder. Why would God give me this free gift? And once we receive this free gift from God, all of a sudden we start to think, see, now I'm a good person and I get to judge the bad people. This whole question is a very difficult question that goes around. Here's number four. Maybe pain is an opportunity to honor God. Maybe the pain that happens in our life is a way to actually turn it and go, God, I'm going to honor you with this instead of be self-absorbed. Instead of letting this destroy my life, I'm going to actually honor you with my pain. Now, pain is real. Grieving is real. It hurts. Life is difficult. But we don't just stay in that place. We say, okay, God, I, I want healing from this. I want to grow through this. I want to become a healthy person person. This scripture in 1 Peter chapter 4 has been a difficult one in my life for all, all my years. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has overcome you to what? To test you again. As though something strange were happening, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when God's glory is revealed. Do you know that we are supposed to participate in the suffering of Christ? We are supposed to understand this depth of pain and hurt and, and heavy of heart so that we can rejoice in our glory with God. You know, God allows us to go through these hard things so that we can reflect him in the meantime. God is testing us and trying us. And I'm not talking about things like, um, oh, I forgot my cell phone charger. Now my phone's going to die. That's not a trial. Or there's no Wi-Fi in your building. Are you kidding me? I pay for data. I need Wi-Fi. Oh, 
Or, how come your coffee's so not good? I just need, I need better coffee. Those are not trials in life. Those are not bad things that happen. I think uh, what God's talking about is a more difficult and a hard kind of like a testing of your faith. Is God going to be there for me when my spouse walks away? Is God going to be there for me when I lose a loved one, when I don't know the direction of my life, when I lose my job? Where is God and he is with us to test us, to show us how to trust him? I'm going to show you this little diagram, this chart, and talk to you just for a brief minute about how God tests us. If you want to fill in some of these circles and some of these lines, on the horizontal line is the word invitation. It's this idea that God invites us into a relationship with him. And uh, if you look at the left side, it's a low invitation, meaning God, uh, or, or sometimes we don't sense God's invitation into life. We just sense that God isn't there. The high invitation is that God is there and he's with us. He invites us and loves us and loves us eternally. And there's nothing that separates us from God. On the vertical line is the word challenge. On the high challenge, God uh, is asking us to do hard things, difficult things in life. And the low challenge is sort of sloth. There's nothing really going on. So you get at the axis points. Now, if you look at all these little circles, I'll just take you around the wheel. At like the two o'clock circle there is the word growth, the word breakthrough. Why? Because God gives us a high challenge in life. And he loves us with a high invitation. And so people are challenged to grow. Do you know that Jesus spent most of his time challenging people to get out of their life of sin? But it was a high invitation. I love you. I will walk with you. I will never leave you. The woman that was at the well, he challenged her. He said, who do you worship? And she ended up being the first evangelist that went into Samaria to talk to other people about faith because he loved her and he also challenged her faith. The woman that was caught in adultery, what did he say to her? Go and sin no more. He challenged her to change her life, but he invited her into relationship. Peter, he said on the water, he said, get out of the boat and walk on the water. That was a high challenge. But it was high love. People, so if you go from the two o'clock, that's what we want is to grow in our faith. If you go down to the four o'clock, that little circle is kind of cozy. Oh, I love that God loves me, but I don't want any challenge in my life. I just want things comfortable and easy. Somebody said to me, hey, wake up the king at two in the morning. I need a drink of water. No, we don't wake up the king because you need water. We, we live this cozy life, this I don't want to be challenged in my faith. I just want to be a Christian and be the lo have God love me and everything will just go easy. Well, what about the seven o'clock on the circle is a low challenge and low invitation. If you're not challenged to grow in your faith and you don't sense God's presence in your life to invite you in a relationship, essentially you're dead. This is why people don't come to God is they say, well, I don't believe in a God who allows bad things to happen. Why would God allow an earthquake to kill people in Japan? Why would God allow uh, difficult things to happen? I'm not going to believe in this. God is, God is too challenging. I'm not going to do that. Or low invitation. He doesn't love me. I have a past that says I'm not lovable. God can't love me. So you're essentially dead spiritually. And then if you go up into the 10 o'clock range on the clock, it says if you have high challenge but low invitation, like you don't sense God's love for you and his invite into your life, but you're challenged, you, you live a stressful life. This is behaviorism. These are the religions that talk about do everything just right. And if you uh, pray enough prayers and say enough words and do enough good deeds, then God will love you. But it's a high stressful religious life and it's difficult. Here's the question, where do you want to be? in this place. If you don't want bad things to happen in your life and you just want it nice and cozy and comfortable, well, then you're not going to grow. If you're going to allow God to grow your life, you're going to allow challenges and difficult things to come in and you're going to face them as a believer and say, I'm going to grow in my faith. I'm going to tell you a story and then I'm going to challenge you. My kids go to Windsor High School and about... Four years ago, when they started going there, my son met one of the Spanish teachers, and her name's Mrs. Rosanoff. I think I may have told you about her before, but uh, he met her, and she was in school for about a month, and she was pregnant, and she was going to have her first son. 
Turns out the son was born down at Aurora. Um, she was flown in a helicopter down there because he had some medical complications. He was born premature. And as he was born, they lived in the Ronald McDonald house and, and sort of was going back and forth to the hospital as a couple every day to check on their son. And he got a brain meningitis, this little boy. And within about two or three weeks, his brain was just eaten away and he died. And on the morning before he died, Ms. Rosanoff said she was getting ready in the morning and she was actually in the shower and she was praying and asking God to save her son. She said, God, I don't know how you can do it but you can save my son. He's got this disease, but it's not fair that he would die. And I just, I don't know what we're going to do. And she sensed from God's Holy Spirit, she sensed the words, do you know my son died also? She heard God move in her spirit and say, my son died too. I know what you feel. And instantly, she sensed the peace of God. She sensed the presence of God. She said, well then, everything will be okay. She and her husband went to the hospital that day and her son died. And she wasn't destroyed. She didn't lose her faith. She didn't run away from God. She didn't hang up her cleats and say, game over, I'm, I'm done with this whole Christian thing. She said, okay, God, you must have something else for me. Well, now four years later, they've adopted another child and they're going to be pregnant again. And the, but she has a ministry in Windsor now where she cares for young moms who have lost their children. She has a small group of people that come in and she loves these ladies who are hurting. So here's the challenge for you this morning. Will you be challenged in your faith or will you just be cozy and comfortable? And here's the question. You might want to write this down. Will you turn your pain outward and help others? Or will you turn your pain inward and be self-absorbed? And what does God want for you? Of course, we need to go through a grieving process. Of course, we need to be hurting when it's time to hurt. There's a lot of scripture that says there's a season for every emotion. But will you turn your pain outward so you can help other people? Or will you turn it inward and let it become self-absorbing and all of a sudden you turn away from God and you turn away from people and you turn away from other things because God just, why would God let bad things happen in my life? Maybe a more challenging question than this is will you look for people that are hurting around you and will you seek to help them? Or do you have your guard up so much because you've been hurt? Nope, I'm not going to help anybody else. I'm not even going to look for other people. You know that we, the church, are the only hope in the world. Do you know that you, the church, are the only hope in the world? Jesus is not going to come back and live another 40 years on the planet and do miracles and then be crucified again and raised from the dead again. He's done his work and he's given us the Holy Spirit so that now we, the church, are the very hands of God and the ears of God and the eyes of God and the feet of God. We can help people who are hurting. Do you know that you are the only answer for the hope in the world. It's so easy to blow past somebody who's hurting and go, yeah, I've been hurting too, no big. Or say, uh, man, I hope they get over it. I, I hope, you know, I hope they find somebody. It's easy to overlook the hurting people. Question is, are you healed enough? Is God in your life enough that you can start to see the hope in the world for other people? Let's pray. God, as we sit here this morning, we can reflect on all the bad things that have happened in our lives. I know of people that have lost spouses or have lost children or have lost jobs or have lost hope. They have chronic pain, chronic diseases, and uh, maybe they're at the end of their life and they can't understand how death is a part of this life. God, it's easy, I believe, to focus on the pain and forget that our eyes are to look at Christ. It's easy to look at our temporary trouble and forget that, God, you are with us. 
I pray this morning for our church that you would remind us again that you are with us and you are here and you are healthy and you are whole and you are good and your character is love and you are fair. So no matter what we face, I pray for the hope of Jesus in our life that we are filled with the love of Christ and the, the presence of God that we can take our pain and help another. I pray this week that you would challenge our church to be involved in others' lives, that we might seek somebody who's hurting. Find somebody who's walked away from their faith because it's not fair that God hurt them. I pray that we would have words this week that bring love and compassion and care to somebody else. God, meet us here in our presence. Meet us in this place where we worship. We love you. Meet us now in these words, God, as we sing. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Everyone said, amen. So I'm going to leave you with a simple image again. I told you this a few months ago. It's, it's very easy. If you put your hands like this or like this, it's easy to look at Christ through our circumstances and say how difficult our life is. But if we can take Christ and put him first and look at our circumstances through Christ, God says, I'm with you. I love you. I'll never leave you. No matter what challenge you face, I've been there with you. I've suffered. My son has died. What's worse than that, right? God says, I know the pain you carry, and I'm with you before your circumstances. Problem is, we walk around like this, and we go, oh, my circumstances are so bad. I live, my, God is so mean, and we miss who Christ is. So keep that in priority, amen? amen. Now, will you open your hands and receive the blessing of God? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.